go. All right. I hope everyone can see me. Everyone can hear me. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Kamal McCarthy, and I'm the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Director for the Town of Nantucket. Before we begin, I just want to review some Zoom expectations for today's event. This event is being recorded and it will be available on the town's website as soon as possible. Please mute your sound throughout the entirety of the lecture and turn off your camera, please. For those of you unaware, I, mean, I, know, I know we've all done many Zoom <laughs> events already, but the mute button is located at the, on the um, Zoom taskbar on the far left. There will also be a Q&A at the end of the event, and we will ask that you place your questions in the chat. The chat function is in the Zoom taskbar between participants and share screen. Also, let me apologize in advance if we don't get to all questions later today. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to share a brief story. I started my position as the DEI director on March 1st, 2021. And approximately two weeks after my start date, I found myself writing a statement of solidarity after the tragic shooting of Asian Americans in Atlanta, Georgia. Fast forward to early 22, when a group of cultural institutions on Nantucket decided to come together and collaborate on cultural celebrations, I volunteered the DEI office to take the lead on acknowledging Asian American and Pacific Islanders Heritage Month. I wanted to know about Nantucket's Asian American Pacific Islanders past, if any. For me, it is always important to look to our past to inform our future. This lecture, supported by the Culture and, Culture and Tourism Department and the DEI office here in Nantucket, aims to highlight just that, Nantucket's AAPI heritage. To find out more about the island specific, <clears throat> Asian American Pacific Islanders past, we have Dr. Francis Cartoonan and today's lecture titled, Pacific Islanders on a Faraway Neighbor Island. Allow me to read a brief biography of Dr. Kartunen before she starts her presentation. Frances Ruley Kartunen is a graduate of Nantucket High School. She had an academic career as a research scientist in linguistics at the University of Texas at Austin. She spent an academic year as guest faculty at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, and also did a lecture tour in New Zealand. Over the years, she has maintained connections with colleagues in Hawaii. When she retired from the University of Texas, Fran came home to Nantucket and wrote The Other Islanders, People Who Pulled Nantucket's Oars. That book, <clears throat> excuse me, contains a chapter about Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders who came to Nantucket. More recently, her article, William Owen, Kahiki about Native Hawaiians settling, about a Native Hawaiian who settled permanently in Nantucket, in Wisconsin, was published in Historic Nantucket. During the COVID-19 shutdown, Fran completed an online course in the Hawaiian language. Without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Francis Cartoonan. Thank you, Kimo. Fans of Herman Melville's Moby Dick will recall that as the novel opens, the, narr the narrator okay. Excuse me, but can you hear me? Yes, okay. Something, something happened. I'll start again. Fans of Herman Melville's Moby Dick will recall that as the novel opens, the narrator, Ismail, arrives at a sailor's boarding house in New Bedford late in the day and agrees to share a room. Even later, he discovers that his roommate, and as it turns out, his bedmate, 
uh, is a Pacific Islander. The next morning, Ismail goes out and is amazed to find Pacific Islanders on the streets. He remarks that in ports, one expects to see sailors uh, from around the world, but only in New Bedford do you come upon Pacific Islanders chatting on street corners. From New Bedford, Ismail continues on to Nantucket, puts up in another boarding house and goes down to the waterfront the next day to sign on for a whaling voyage. But he makes no mention of noticing Pacific Islanders on the streets of Nantucket. And here it's worth recalling that when Melville wrote Moby Dick, he'd never been to Nantucket, visiting only after the book was published. Yet most certainly there were Pacific Islanders to be seen on Nantucket. Beginning in the 1820s and continuing for several decades, uh, Pacific Islanders, including native Hawaiians, were a constant presence on Nantucket to the point that a mainland letter writer once claimed that young Pacific Island men were suspected of erecting ensigns of idolatry and taking part in frantic orgies on the streets of Nantucket during moonlit nights. The, the letter writer suggested that Nantucket needed a seaman's Bethel like the one in New Bedford to curb such practices. Um, I'm trying to advance my slide here. Let's see what happens. Is that okay? A Nantucketer responded indignantly that people should let all nations walk in their own ways and wondered why so much pain should be taken to represent Nantucket as a nest of people involved in heathen darkness and suffering for want of missionaries. He wrote that he re recollected seeing young men having a good time on the streets and that it never occurred to anyone on Nantucket that they were practicing religious rites. On the contrary, at the time these letters were exchanged, three young Pacific Islanders who had previously studied in a Sabbath school at the First Congregational Church had just departed on a Nantucket whale ship headed back to carry the gospel to their countrymen on the islands of the Pacific. Simultaneously, a congregational church was reopening its Sabbath school for 120 newly admitted scholars, including seven native Hawaiians. The presence of native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders on Nantucket began very soon after two whale ships, the Balena from New Bedford and the Equator from Nantucket succeeded in taking a sperm whale in Kealakekua Bay, offshore from the big island of Hawaii in 1819. The vessels then continued on to the island of Maui where they took on two native Hawaiian men as crew members. The town of Lahaina on Maui rapidly developed into Hawaii's primary whaling port. From 1820 onward, young native Hawaiian men signed on to whale ships and traveled all the way to the vessel's home ports, most specifically New Bedford and Nantucket. At the time, the Hawaiian Islands were known to the English speaking world as the Sandwich Islands. Their indigenous peoples were sometimes called Sandwich Islanders and more often Kanakas from the Hawaiian word for person. To accommodate those who made their way to Nantucket, there was a Kanaka boarding house operated by an apparently half Maori man and his African-American wife. From From the 1820s through the 1850s, although omitted from the story of Nantucket as a whaling port, Kanakas were always part of the scene on Nantucket. The 1850 federal census for Nantucket includes the names of nearly 600 seamen aboard Nantucket vessels 
Of them, 65 were Pacific Islanders, and of these, 45 were specifically identified as from Hawaii. This doesn't necessarily mean they were native Hawaiians because they tended to be identified by from what island they joined the crew and people were moving around the Pacific quite a bit. But 45 were identified as from Hawaii. As far as the census taker was concerned, Kanakas were black. Some of them were using island names such as Oahu and Maui as surnames. Others used Kanaka as a surname. Most took on English shipboard names such as Joe, Jack, Mike, Harry, whatever. Three men who signed onto a ship in the Friendly Islands, as Tonga was then known, used Rarotonga, the name of one of the Cook Islands, as a surname but their shipboard buddy went by the name of Benjamin Hathaway. Six black crew members on Nantucket whale ships in 1850 used the surname Coffin. Although there was a dedicated boarding house on Nantucket for these men, and although they were encouraged to attend church and Sabbath school, there was a tragic aspect to their presence on Nantucket. At the bitter end of February 1832, a man was found frozen in the shelter of a barn on Nantucket's North Shore. The dead man was identified as a Kanaka who had come to Nantucket on a whale ship from around Cape Horn. He was known to have been living in Nantucket's Negro town, New Guinea. One can imagine that aware he was dying, he had managed to walk from five corners all the way to the cliff in order to be in sight of water when his end came. Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders shared a belief that there are jumping off points for the soul where land meets the sea. Five years later, Another Kanaka, a 35-year-old Sandwich Island Indian, or Kanaka, also died at the end of February. Five Pacific Islanders who arrived suffering from smallpox were taken from their vessel to quarantine in Nantucket's pest house and all died within a matter of days. Between 1832 and 1848, at least 20 Pacific Islanders' deaths were recorded on Nantucket. They died of consumption or lung fever, probably tuberculosis, smallpox, and typhus, diseases that they acquired on the way to Nantucket, where they came to their end in port. How could anyone weakened by shipboard illness be expected to survive? specifically to survive a Nantucket winter. And yet, some of these men did survive, at least for a while. William Whippy, proprietor of the Kanaka boarding house, made his way from New Zealand to Nantucket, married, fathered three children, and became an entrepreneur. But he could not escape contagion. All three of his children died in childhood, and William Whippy himself died of tuberculosis at age 45. A man who had been born in 1819 in Lahaina on the island of Maui came to Nantucket, where he was known as John Swain and was classified as Black. At the opening of the Civil War, he was reported to have enlisted with other men from Nantucket to fight for the Union. He died in 1865, and the case has been made that he was the John Swain, whose name was the very last inscribed on the monument to Nantucket's Union dead. He was buried in Nantucket's historic colored cemetery. If Lahaina-born Black John Swain is the veteran whose name is on the monument, 
Then of the Nantucket men of color who enlisted and served, about 20 in all, he is the only one to have lost his life due to that war. All the Pacific Islanders who came to Nantucket in the 1800s were single men. Some were teenagers, but most were young men in their 20s. Their stay on the island, if they were healthy and survived, was turnaround time before setting out again on another whaling voyage. Nantucket's whaling industry began to collapse in the 1850s and fewer and fewer whale ships were coming back from the Pacific whaling grounds with their cosmopolitan crews. The presence of Kanakas on Nantucket, with very few exceptions, came to an end and was forgotten. In innkeeper William Whippy had succumbed to tuberculosis at the time when whaling from Nantucket was still at its height, however. He has not been entirely forgotten because a sign of his boarding house has survived along with some documentation of his life. We know that he married Mariah Ross, whose father, James Ross Sr., reported to the federal census that he had been born in Africa. William Whippy was part of Dantucket's community of color, living in the New Guinea neighborhood and providing accommodation to Pacific Islanders during their stays on Nantucket. The Whippy children were buried in Nantucket's historic colored cemetery. And although he has no headstone, William was undoubtedly buried there with them. A couple of decades later, John Swain was interred there as well. Probably all the Pacific Islanders who died on Nantucket were laid to rest in unmarked graves in the historic colored cemetery. All but one. One native Hawaiian had a remarkably different experience on Nantucket. A man using the name William Owen reported that he had been born on the big island of Hawaii and first went to sea around 1841 at the age of 13. By 1850, he was a seasoned whaleman when his name together with that of a slightly younger Joe Owen appears in the 1850 census of crew members serving on Nantucket whale ships. There's no further record of Joe Owen, who may have been William's younger brother, but William made Nantucket his home, his home port. And over the years, he was classified as black, mulatto, and colored. Seamen who were classified as black were consigned to residence in New Guinea. And to begin with, William, and Joel Owen probably put up there. William slipped away to the village of Siastanza, however, and lived a life apparently free from segregation or racial bias. In 1853, he acquired land in Stanza through an intermediary, his friend Robert Pittman. Pittman bought the land from Alexander Swain, and two days later, he sold it to William Owen for the same price. The fact that William Owen did not make the purchase directly may imply racial discrimination, but if so, it is the last instance recorded. Owen bought a house in town and had it moved seven miles to Sconset. The house in question had been located in or near New Guinea, but its previous owner was Jared Tracy, a white Nantucketer who appears with his wife, Mary Huzzy Tracy, and their seven children in the Barney genealogical record. Having secured his real estate, William Owens executed a power of attorney to my friend Robert Pittman and departed from New Bedford as second mate on the bark Marcella bound for the Pacific whaling grounds. The voyage lasted three years. Upon his return in 1861, William Owen, then 33 years old, married Julia Leonard, 
who had been born in Dublin, Ireland, and had been living with Samuel and Anne Swain in Nantucket. While working in the Swain household, Julia had also been attending school in Nantucket. During the summers, the Swains moved out to Sconset, which may be where Julia met William Owen. After their marriage, William and Julia settled into his house in Sconset. William took to the sea again just six months later, this time as first mate of the bark R.L. Barstow. Once again, he was away for three years, rejo rejoining Julia on land in 1865, just as the Civil War had come to a close. He had been far away at sea for the duration of the war. Whaling from Nantucket was in precipitous decline and William switched to cod fishing off Sconset. In his new life on shore, he became father of a large family of girls, seven daughters in all. And as a cod fisherman, he became a local celebrity. His name was constantly in the news as having caught the first cod of the season, a remarkably large codfish, or a record number of codfish. He participated in daring rescues in the dangerous shoals off the east of Nantucket. And once on his solitary row home at the end of a day of fishing, he had a brush, brush with death that was first reported in print and then made into a widely published ballad. He became one of the members of the newly formed Sconset Volunteer Fire Department was named a special policeman for summers in the village, was appointed village lamplighter, and was a charter member of a Sconset men's club. As seawater bathing was increasingly promoted, attracting summer visitors to new hotels in Sconset, William Owen promoted Kanaka surfboards for the visitors. A fellow men's club member, George Rogers, took orders for making them. Unlike other Pacific Islanders who fetched up on Nantucket shores, William Owen survived, stayed, married, raised a family, did not live in semi-segregated New Guinea, and was apparently included and accepted in every way by the community of Corresponsitors. What is more, although he made their native Hawaiian heritage clear to his many daughters, the Owen girls married into old Nantucket families who appear in the Barney genealogy. Here's a couple of, couple of his seven daughters, his youngest two were twins. William Owen's daughter Priscilla believed that her father had some connection to native Hawaiian royalty, the Ali'i, and would have been granted land had he returned to Hawaii. Instead, he remained a member of the Sconset community, a sort of nobility of its own. To his death in 1889 at the age of 61, which at the time was a ripe old age, he was laid to rest not in the historic colored cemetery, but in Prospect Hill Cemetery. William Owen's experience on Nantucket was unique. He was a holo kahiki, a native Hawaiian who journeyed to faraway lands and stayed. Among Pacific Islanders, there is a concept of neighbor island. Not only do the residents of Hawaii consider their islands to constitute a neighbor group, they extend their neighborliness all the way across the Pacific to Tahiti and New Zealand as neighbor islands. And in the 21st century, they have extended even further to Nantucket. In October 2001, a group of Native Hawaiian students from New a group of Native Hawaiian students from New England universities 
came to Nantucket to honor the ancestors who had died here on island. Fort Kanakas, Joseph Dix, John Swain, Thomas Clay, John Smith, William Owen, and the others whose names have not been recorded. Nolani Arista, Ikaika Hazi, and Lahuanani Yim composed Mele Kanikau, Morning Chants for the Dead, and sang them twice, once in the historic colored cemetery, and again in the nearby African meeting house where they raised the Hawaiian flag. Their English translation of part of the Mele is as follows. Alas, our kupuna kane have already died, gone, never to return to Hawaii. Farewell, birds that have flown from the nest, young men that have flown to a foreign land, from the jagged cliffs and the expansive flatlands and the ocean sea mist. These men who traveled in foreign lands, gone, never to return, adversaries of the whale. The word in the Hawaiian original of this mele for the men who traveled in foreign lands is the one we have used to describe William Owen. Holo kahiki. Learning that Mary Gulick, descendant of some of the congregational ministers, uh, missionaries who went to Hawaii in the 1800s was a resident at our island home, the Hawaiian students went there and placed a lay of miley leaves around her shoulders. Mary Gulick was deeply moved and said to them, I can't believe you were so kind to me, considering that my ancestors caused harm to your ancestors. In the spirit of aloha, they honored Mary's age and her Hawaiian haole lineage. For, for more detail about Pacific Islanders' connections to Nantucket, see the other islanders, people who pulled down Tuckett's oars. And to learn more about the life and family of William Owen, please, and also to see some vintage photos, please see the fall 2021 issue of Historic Nantucket for the article, William Owen, Holo Kahiki, by myself and by Owen descendant Cameron Texter. Thank you. Ryan, thank you very much for that presentation. I think the entire audience learned a lot this evening. Thank you. And I believe your co-writer, uh, Cam Mr. Cameron Texter is his name, is in the audience, if I'm not mistaken. So I, this is the time for Q&A. We will be um, just wrapping this up very shortly. So I'd like to give the audience a chance to write any questions in the uh, chat box. Um, or if you need to, perhaps just ask um, Dr. Cartoonan a question directly. If you're going to ask the question directly, just use the raise your hand function so that I can just acknowledge you really quickly. Um, Fran, while we wait for questions, I'm just going to start off because I wrote a couple down myself. Um, I found William o Owen Holoka Hiki article very interesting. So um, I, I was curious about just whaling in the Pacific in general. Um, I was, so my first question is kind of like a three-part question, um, and I apologize if I just don't know, if I didn't pay too much attention in uh, American history, but uh, how popular was Whalen in the Pacific, and did it produce wealth on like an Nantucket scale for a specific community out west? And my second part to that question is, did Pacific Islanders contribute any specific um, skills or tools that were used in Whalen? Hmm. Well, to begin with, um, whaling was taking place in the Atlantic Ocean. It had a long history, I and mean, the Basques had been whaling before anybody even came to Nantucket. Um, and then 
when Nantucketers began traveling on the open ocean, they, they um, went whaling in what they called the Brazil whaling grounds. But late in the 1700s, they finally made their way around Cape Horn into the Pacific, where they found very rich Pacific whaling grounds. And that was what really made Nantucket rich. Um, are we OK? <laughs> um, it might be full screen. Well, I guess we're good. Um, so I don't know of anything besides extremely good seamanship on the part of Pacific Islanders that they contribute to, to whaling. I mean, the famous contribution to uh, whaling um, was a toggle harpoon, but that was invented by an African-American in New Bedford. Uh, but certainly, um, without being able to pick up crew members uh, once they were in the Pacific, um, Nantucket whaling would have not been able to be as expansive as it was or as, um, as profitable. Uh, the, the reason that people who join the crew once the voyage was in progress and traveled all the back, way back to New Bedford and Nantucket was that if you traveled all the way to the home port, you got a, uh, a share. It might be a very small share, but a share in the profits. Whereas if you just got on in one island and got off in another island, um, you got very little, if anything. And I think that, um, ship owners and captains really encourage people to get off and not come back home because um, then you wouldn't have to pay them very much. But on the other hand, people wanted to take part in the profit of the voyage. And so they stubbornly stayed on to the end. Thank you for that. I'm gonna ask another question and then I see Beverly has her hand raised. So then I'll go to Beverly next. Uh, my second question is specifically about William Owen. Um, so William Owen, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but he was classified as black in an early census. Then he was classified as white by the town clerk, William Cobb. Another census identified him as mulatto and his death certificate identified him as colored. Yeah. So my question is, how did William Owen identify himself, <laughs> number one? And secondly, what were the advantages and or consequences to an individual with a fluid racial identity? Well, from what Cameron has been able to tell me, um, William Owen um, made a point of his native Hawaiian heritage to the family. He, he never, um, denied it or, or tried to evade it. Uh, but somehow or other, the fact that he did not live in New Guinea, but instead from very early on lived in Syasconset seemed to have um, made it possible for him to simply not face racial discrimination. Um, he, he's the only native Hawaiian or, Na or Pacific Islander I know of um, who was not buried in the college cemetery. Uh, so he, um, he had a different experience. If you look at, um, for instance, um, John Swain, um, he lived and, and died and was buried in Nantucket's black community. He never had a town job, whereas uh, William Owen had a whole series of town jobs, town appointed and town paid. So um, it, was, it was different and it was unique. Thank you for that. And the next question comes from Beverly, then the individual with the last name Constable. I'm sorry. Beverly, you're up. Okay. Um, my question, I think I looked this up years ago, but I forgot the answer. Um, 
what was happening on the West Coast? It's such a long trip to go to whaling in the Pacific when you're over in Massachusetts. And so what was the West Coast, California, well, it wasn't, I'm trying to think when it became a state, but anyway, was there any whaling from the West Coast, whether it was United States or before United States or after it became United States? That's my question. Well, what, what happened with the West Coast was that was where Nantucket whale ships went to die. <laughs> But when um, whaling began to co collapse in Nantucket, a lot of Nantucketers uh, went to the California Gold Rush, and they went on Nantucket whale ships that were then simply left to um, sink and rot in San Francisco Bay. Uh, the, the whale ships that were actively involved in whaling, when they got done, they were anxious to get their whale oil cargoes home and they headed straight for Cape Horn, rounding it as quickly as possible and heading up the coast to New Bedford and Nantucket. And of course, New Bedford went on whaling quite a lot longer than Nantucket because New Bedford had a deep water port and a, and a railhead. Um, whereas Nantucket's harbor was rather difficult to access in the ships as they got bigger and heavier. And uh, there was a tremendous fire in Nantucket in 1846, and the whole thing led to Nantucket yes. completely losing out to New Bedford. And Nantucket lost a lot of population actually to California after, uh, during and after the gold rush. I believe the next question is from Constable. Hi there, Hi. Dr. Cartoonin. I'm Posey Constable and I'm a native Hawaiian and my mom's side of the family left Boston on the eighth missionary ship around Cape Horn to go to Hawaii. And they went to go, um, you know, bring the word of God to those poor Hawaiians who had a, a religion of their own, but had to get a new one. Um, and my dad's side were um, Hawaiian and, and English sea captains. So I wanted to respond first to one question that I heard uh, about what were some of the contributions of Hawaiians to whaling. And I would say more than anything, it was their ability to navigate and their, their uh, extreme sensitivity and wayfinding uh, as was evidenced by the round the world travel of the ancient um, uh, reenactment of the Hawaiian sailing canoes that went around the world, which is an amazing story in and of itself. The second thing I wanted to point out, my dad was taught how to swim by Duke Kahanamoku and um, was a long line friend of the Kahanamoku family. And when Duke went to represent the United States in the Olympics and traveling uh, across the country to the East Coast, he was frequently branded as, um, as a black man, mm -hmm. um, but his humility and um, you know, willingness, his bringing aloha to the sport of swimming and then going on to win many gold medals was testament to you know, just the kind of things that Pacific Islanders had to face when they left their own islands and, and came to, the, to North America um, and struggled through the same experiences that um, Black men and women experienced in North America. And I guess the final thing is uh, here on Nantucket to, to now have heard from you what a rich history we've had of people traveling all the way back from uh, Hawaii to the East Coast on whaling ships is just fascinating. I can't wait to sit and talk story with you about your experience at University of Hawaii in Manoa. I'd love to uh, come back. I've been invited. Good. <laughs> My my last my last time there was just before the uh, COVID shutdown, hmm. and it's come back next January, and of course, couldn't do it. But that's uh, okay. I'm here on Nantucket, so I'm going to join you for coffee one time soon. Okay, good. You know, I'd like to just interject something, and that's about the history of surfing on Nantucket. Uh, it goes way back because there was a guy named Prentice Mulford who reported from Sconset in 1887 about 
Kanaka surfboards. So 1887, when he wrote that the ocean bathers who are now flocking to Sconset in the summers should employ Kanaka surfboards in bathing, not only as a measure of safety, but to add to the pleasure of buffeting the billows. <laughs> not only learners, but skillful swimmers take to them kindly for the boards have sufficient buoyant power to sustain them longer in the water without tiring. Bathers rest on them, either on their breasts or backs, throw them aside, take them up again, ride with them over the wave crest, sit astride them and indulge in various antics in sporting in the water. And this was 1887. So according to Mulford, um, William Owen's friend George Rogers had already made a number of surfboards in Sconset and had orders for more. So that's the deep history of surfing on Nantucket. And thank you for that as well. Before we close, is there an... an <clears throat> And my last question is, and unless the group has more questions, include in the resources that you shared at the end of your presentation, the Historic Nantucket, as well as the book, um, The Other Islanders, are there other resources people can go and read or find that tells us about Nantucket's um, Asian American Pacific Islander heritage? I wish there were. Um, Cameron is a dedicated, um, researcher and genealogist. You know, there was one other person, a Nantucket teacher, and she was a descendant of William Owens, but I don't think anybody ever knew it. Um, Helen Winslow Chase taught American history at Nantucket High School from right after the World War II until the 1950s. And she had earned a teaching degree from Bridgewater State College. But then she went to the University of Wisconsin and got an MA in American history. And then she did some research at Mystic Seaport and went to the University of Hawaii and did coursework and spent a year traveling around the islands of the Pacific. Um, so she was, the summer librarian for the Nantucket Historical Association, and she left her own large library to the NHA. So one of the things one might do is have a look at the Hello Winslow, Helen Winslow Chase collection. But, you know, we were all clueless that she had Native Hawaiian heritage. Uh, I don't know whether she hid it or didn't think Nantucketers would be interested, but look what she did. She went to the Pacific herself. Good for her. Thanks for sharing that. Before we close, I see that Cameron Texter has turned on his camera and we are talking about his relatives. So I want to give him the opportunity to see if he wants to add any word before we close tonight. Mr. Texter. Uh, well, thank you. I just uh, wanted to thank Francis for her good work and by the way, Francis and I are actually uh, distant cousins, but we're distant cousins through uh, uh, the Bunker family, uh, through my uh, great-grandfather, my uh, uh, great-grandmother, uh, uh, Priscilla Owen, married Benjamin Garfield Russell, and he was, he was related to all the uh, founding families of Nantucket, and through him, uh, Francis and I are seventh cousins uh, because of that. So I wanted to mention that. And also what's kind of funny is uh, my mother uh, was, is a native Nantucketer. Uh, she, was, she was born there. And uh, uh, so all my family goes all the way back to the founding. And then there are other ancestors. I have other relatives and cousins who, who live there. But the other interesting thing is when my mother was in uh, high school, her, her boyfriend, when she was in high school was Francis's brother. So I, I just had to, to mention that other, when, when, when Francis and I connected, I immediately knew who she was because my mother often talked about Bob Rooley. And uh, my mother, when she was 13, she started working at the North Shore restaurant whose Francis's family owned. And so there's a lot of connections between Francis and myself. So it just shows you that if you look close enough, you'll find connections uh, on Nantucket with almost anyone that that's that's lived there.
And uh, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I, when I started uh, researching William Owen, I found uh, Francis's, uh, I, I only had a few things. I had a lot of stories from my mother, but uh, uh, I, I found Francis's book, The Other Islanders, and I highly recommend it. There's so many great stories in it. And uh, I contacted her and I said, I, I see you wrote a little bit about William. Uh, do you know that much more about him? And then I started sharing all the information and she got so interested, she ran with it and we worked on the article and uh, it's been so, so great to work with her and I really appreciate her uh, making this presentation tonight. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you for the only that. other thing I would I would add is uh, uh, my my only reason I know so much about it is my mother uh, uh, Priscilla Cook Texter. She was raised by her great grandmother there at 144 Main Street. That was Priscilla Owen, and she told her story after story about William Owen. That's how I I came to know so much about him. And then my mother took me there. Uh, we went every summer to Nantucket, and she took me to the Whaling Museum when we did research together when I was 13. But one of the stories my mother loved to tell is uh, that William Owen always wanted a son. And as Francis said, uh, she had, he had, uh, he and uh, Julia Leonard, uh, who my, my Irish second uh, great grandmother, they had five daughters and they decided in uh, uh, 1877 to try again to have a son. And as, uh, Francis mentioned they were very successful, but they were very surprised because they had twin daughters. And not only that, William at the time was 50 years old and Julia was 41 years old. So it's pretty amazing that Julia had her last two children at the age of 41 and they were twins. And then William, uh, uh, when William went, went out on his, he was captain of his his own uh, cod ship, as Francis said, every day when he went out on the ocean, his seven daughters would line up on the trying sh because they, they would think he wasn't going to come back. So he was always rowing out every day out into the ocean with his seven daughters lined up crying because they, they feared he wouldn't come back. But he always did until uh, he died at the age of 61. That certainly adds context to today's um, lesson that Francis has taught us. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, again, a reminder to everyone that today's lecture was brought to you by the DEI office and the Culture and Tourism Department for the town of Nantucket. And Francis, I promise not to say anything else after this, so I'll give you the final word to close us out. Aloha. <laughs> Have a good evening, everyone. Take care.